Hi, this is your host, Sapnil Bharatiya, and once again, welcome to TFR Let's Talk. And we have with us Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co founder of Rack. And Rob, once again, it's good to have you on the show. Hey, Swap is a pleasure as always. It is a pleasure. And today we are going to talk about a new term that got coined de virtualization. I mean, is it de-virtualizing or should we just call it bare metal? Uh, so, so talk a bit about that. I am pretty sure that these are two different things, not the same thing. Uh, first of all, let's talk about, we used to talk deal with bare metal, then we start talking about virtualization because virtualization solves a lot of problems. If you look at the telco industry, I mean, we, we work in the open stack space and it changed the whole market. And now we are talking about de-virtualization. So why is it? Yeah, and it's worth noting, Gartner's putting this at the very beginning of the their hype cycle stage. Um, the, the thing that's, the, you know, every every data center has bare metal. Bare metal is the underlying root of, of every data center. But what we've seen, and, and RackN specializes in bare metal and bare metal automation, what we've seen is that it is universally virtualized. Unless you've, you've got a very specific, like a storage appliance or something like that, most companies employ virtualization, um, VMware dominates that space, and so there, there's quite a lot of infrastructure that's purchased for the purpose of running virtualized platforms. On top of that, even companies that are doing layers above that, like with Kubernetes or other containerized workloads, typically spin that up in VMs, um, so many layers above that bare metal space. And so I think part of what we're talking about here is a challenge to this core assumption that all infrastructure that enterprises are buying is virtualized or that clouds are buying is virtualized. How would you define or how does Garten define virtualization? And I'm talking about not as a definition, but also in the tech uh, terms as well. When we look at the current infrastructure that people buy, they typically buy it and install a virtualization layer on it. That's really the first thing they do. A lot of times they'll, they'll use the term hyper-converged infrastructure. So some of these platforms are just virtualizing the infrastructure and some of them combine a storage subsystem and the virtualization into the same hardware or into adjacent hardware. And that's actually sold as a unit. So the dominant architecture in IT infrastructure so far has been really focused on this virtualized infrastructure stack. Um, and that's been true you know, from cloud infrastructures for um, on-premise infrastructures, even edge infrastructure, there's, there's very commonly um, a virtualization layer applied. And there's a good reason why historically it's, it's been applied and why, why it's, it's considered best practice or has been considered best practice is that in order to really control the infrastructure to provide strong APIs, containment over subscription, um, the ability to sort of oversubscribe and use that infrastructure, things like vMotion, where you're able to keep a virtual machine up and running by transferring it to different hosts. All of those things require a virtualization layer of some sort to do that type of work. But time's changing. Uh, new technology and cost factors and vendor factors are starting to impact um, how people think of that equation. When we look at this virtual virtualized layer, are there any challenges that you are seeing or the market is seeing? Uh, why are we talking about de-virtualization? Is it in a, because what I knew or what we heard back then was that virtualization actually allows you to move faster because you are not tied to a specific hardware. The fact is even when we're talking about, you know, function as a service or serverless, I mean, the hardware is there and, you know, hardware has its own limit. You know, that's why, you know, with virtualization and software defined things, you can scale and you can do a lot of things. But the fact is that there is always hardware. There is always bare metal. So so what was the challenge with virtualization and why are we talking about de-virtualization? So there's a couple of drivers uh, for de-virtualization, one of which we've covered in several conversations already, which is the challenges with uh, the VMware acquisition by Broadcom and Broadcom going in and raising the rates and, and, and challenging the status quo for how licenses of virtualization are bought and what, what the costs are for them. Um, and so, you know, companies that are evaluating their commitment to VMware are now looking for alternatives much more much more aggressively. And 
VMware's always been expensive for these companies, both in an architectural sense and an actual price sense. Uh, but you're you're right. There are a lot of advantages to being able to to buy and subscribe. But that's not the only thing that's happening in the market right now. Um, one thing is that Kubernetes has really become a dominant platform, and you know people have for a long time been asking if they can bypass a virtualization layer if they're using Kubernetes and go directly to Metal. Um, we are seeing some alternate alternate uh, vendors to VMware now that Broadcom's sort of making the pricing. Um, forcing the conversation. We're, we're seeing more alternatives for that. And we're also seeing a challenge with GPUs and, and sharing and reallocating of GPUs. As more and more workloads include uh, some type of inferencing not, not, and training, training actually would just consume a whole system, but uh, even inferencing, in those cases, the ability to virtualize a GPU is still pretty limited. And in some cases, you know, I've seen people questioning if it's even a, a valid um, need. And so what we're watching happen is companies are starting to look at what they need to virtualize. Virtualizing CPUs makes a ton of sense. Oversubscribing RAM makes it, you know, oversubscribing a system makes a ton of sense. It's not clear that you have the same benefit for GPU and GPU workloads. And so as companies look at what they're trying to buy here, the simple equation of I need compute, storage, and networking has been disrupted by asking I need compute, inf I need GPU inference capabilities, I, I need storage, but not as much, I need a different type of networking, a lot more east-west networking potentially, right? All of those things have changed the conversation that people have when they look at how they want to buy hardware. It also is a factor with power. And um, a lot of the customer data centers that we're talking to, um, even if they don't have immediate power con constraints, they're worried about their power budgets. And so they are looking for architectural changes. They're looking for processor family changes. They're looking for different ways to economize on how their systems are going to run. Um, and that can translate into rethinking, you know, a, a lot of long held assumptions. And that to me, when we look at devirtualization here, what we're really doing, just like we do with hybrid cloud, where it's not a question of should I use bare metal or cloud? It's always a question of what my mix is or which clouds I should use. It's all it's a question of mix. And so for companies that are looking at their mix, instead of assuming that they virtualized everything, they're starting to think through what can I change the mix for? What can I save money and complexity by pulling out a virtualization layer? Uh, and, and there is a fundamental premise with this that you were hinting at when you talked about software-defined infrastructure, that there's an underlying premise here that we can do more automation and APIs and controls at the physical layer than we were doing before. There have been innovations and breakthroughs that make bare metal and bare metal automation, bare metal cloud, actually much more equivalent in controls and capabilities and abstraction uh, compared to a virtualization layer. And so, so there's a lot more flexibility now at the bare metal layer. Perfect. And what are these options? Swap, there's an amazing number of options with this. And this is one of Rackend's specialties. So we help companies that are really looking for improved choice and optionality in bare metal infrastructure. Some of that's just being able to improve your supply chain and have different vendors. Some of it's thinking through the size of systems that you're buying. You might not have to buy systems that are highly optimized for virtualization with a lot of RAM or very high interconnects or storage arrays under them. You can actually look at systems that are much more cost effective or use commodities differently. Um, and then that means being able to run a Kubernetes or a containerized system directly on those metal processors. And then, you know, let the Kubernetes subsystem manage the scheduling and oversubscription. And there's been a lot of um, reports about how you can oversubscribe virtualization or how a virtualized system is actually able to perform better. Um, there, there are some NUMA processing rules that um, do make you know, oversubscribing virtual machines um, potentially more performant. I will tell you, we do not see customers running virtualized uh, hosts at 100% utilization to get those benefits. The reality of being able to intermix a whole bunch of containerized systems and run your, run your systems, your hosts at a, at a high level of capacity is, is a very good option for a lot of companies, especially if you can then buy 
a, a simpler or a lower number of socket machines. Be, right, we, we have a very weird situation where, in some cases, the licensing and the way VMware has licensed has caused people to choose a certain number of sockets, the ratios of the processors and how, how they build machines and, and, and buy very expensive machines to maximize that socket performance. Um, when devirtualization, you come back and you look at what am I actually trying to accomplish? What am I trying to run? In a lot of cases, that's, you know, there's already a scheduler working in these systems and you can change the balance and you don't have to buy the fastest processor or the fastest interconnect. You could actually buy smaller machines and then manage your, your cost and power profiles much more discreetly. Um, so it, it's a remarkable amount of flexibility that's empowered by looking at these systems in a very different way and challenging that simple assumption of I have to virtualize, I have to put a big storage array to manage the virtualization. And that doesn't mean everything's going to be devirtualized, right? There's there's some workloads, especially older legacy ones that rely on vMotion or rely on high uptime or rely on you know the virtualized APIs. Those things, you know, it doesn't it make sense to keep them where they are. But, you know, what we're seeing is a lot of the new workloads that companies are writing, that they're, that they're designing for the cloud, those can be migrated to a uh, bare metal infrastructure, devirtualized infrastructure, and run very effectively um, with immutable uh, OS deployments. You can run them with high API, high turn rates, letting the machines get reset and adjusted. Right, all these things that we're used to having virtual machines required to do, none of those things you know require virtual machines. We have replicated all of the performance and API controls that you get in virtual machines and clouds on bare metal. That's that's a core tenant of how Rackend provides value for our customers. And the more people treat that bare metal like a cloud, the more options they have, the faster they get ROIs, the more flexibility they have on being able to change out vendors and and then actually intermix virtual cloud, low, low cost virtual, open source virtual, and bare metal as a, as a mixed estate, but still have very consistent results. And when we look at you know, uh, this term, because whenever we coin a new term, we always ask, is this really a real thing or is just you know, the market? Either the industry, media, or analysts are looking for the new buzzword because we do need uh, the next shiny object. So from your perspective, who has invested heavily in bare metal infrastructure, how do you look at it? It is funny when somebody, you know, when, when new a new term surfaces and you scratch your head and, and ask if it's real. I do think that this is a legitimate word being used by executives in enterprises as they they start to discuss what they're doing. And so I, I don't think it's exactly a buzzword. I, I think that there's a trend here. I think that there's a very real conversation going on in enterprise IT shops where they're looking to pull back and away from re, re, from, from virtualization. And so they, they are, I believe, legitimately using this word as a strategy for the next three to five years. Um, the thing that's been amazing to me, and it's, it's sort of funny, is we have, we have tried a, a number of different things to talk about the physical layer of data centers. And bare metal, um, which always seems to me to be a sort of strange uh, description for what we're talking about, which is the server with, without a virtualization layer, um, remains the, the dominant term uh, in the industry when we talk about, you know, Devirtualized infrastructure, and so I, I don't expect we're going to start talking about uh, devirtualized servers instead of bare metal servers. I, I think that is is going to going to be there. So it's it's not exactly a, a buzzwordy term like you know edge uh, has been or hybrid cloud or multi cloud things like that. Um, but I do think it's a legitimate conversation of what's happening in boardrooms um, when companies look at at their IT mix and start making decisions about how they're going to approach uh, this infrastructure. And they're going to start looking at those AI systems that they're buying, that new generation, that hardware refresh, and um, legitimately asking, can this be devirtualized? So from that perspective, Swap, I, I do think this is a, a very real term um, that you're going to hear in the industry. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, buy a lot of ticket on it becoming a buzzword. No, when we you know when you're saying it's a real thing, 
how different is it from just bare metal you know uh, uh, because bare metal its own limitation its own advantages virtualization its own advantage its own limitation so how different is devirtualization from bare metal is it not going back to the metal but we needed a new term so that people are like hey no not again bare metal i think that that we are going to still think of this as bare metal i think the operators and the the admins and and the it people who are doing the work are still going to think of this as bare metal um but the, the reason why I think it's important to have a term for this is there is an underlying architecture change. And so what we're looking at is actually thinking through what do I need to buy? How do I put it together? The, it's easy to forget because virtualization has so dominated the IT landscape for the past almost 15 years now that we have been buying systems in a specific virtualization pattern for a long time. And that to me is the real trend here. It's actually being able to look at your IT buying patterns, your IT architectures, and start asking about, wait a second, do I have a virtualized architecture or a de-virtualized architecture? And to me, that's the essence of why this term is important. It sort of talks through challenging the assumption that people have been making in their buy decisions for so long. Um, but ultimately, to your point, um, you know, they're going to be buying bare metal. Some of that bare metal, they're going to apply to virtualized infrastructure, and some of it they're going to be applying to non-virtualized infrastructure. Um, and, and what I would imagine is, you know, instead of it being the negative term, we're going to be talking about what people want to use that for. So we're going to have, you know, and we already see this happen within our customer base. They have infrastructure that they buy to virtualize, they have infrastructure that they buy for AI and AI inference. They have infrastructure they buy for Kubernetes and container management and for storage. And so what, what we're really seeing, and I think this is the normal, the new normal, is companies are going to buy infrastructure for, you know, for a role, for a purpose, and that's what they're going to be looking at it for. One thing I do hope, though, out of this is that we have been using virtualization as a way to normalize infrastructure so that companies didn't have to worry about why they bought hardware. And I'm hoping that we're going to continue to get into a place where hardware and the, the, what people buy can be more repurposed and reused. One of the biggest waste factors that we see, and this happens both in virtualized and, and de-virtualized infrastructure, is that companies tend to buy, buy infrastructure on siloed budgets for departments or, or functions. And then that infrastructure is locked into that function. And it can't, it can't be repurposed or reused easily. It can't be shared easily. Um, and even with virtualization, it was supposed to help with that. It, it really didn't. So what, what I'm hopeful here is that this de-virtualization trend is going to turn into an opportunity to actually have more general purpose infrastructure to improve the utilization rates, because now we can take infrastructure that was bought for one use and repurpose it into another. That, the ROI on being able to do that is tremendous, right? These are expensive assets. They get locked into a, a, a silo or an organization. They don't have high utilization or they reach a life cycle and they could be repurposed. If we have the controls and the automation and the workflows to actually treat these infra this infrastructure, this bare metal infrastructure as a more fungible asset, then it can be reused, its life can be extended, it can be shared. That type of bare metal cloud thinking where you're treating your infrastructure more generally is amazingly powerful from an ROI perspective and something that best in class do think of their infrastructure that way, but it's very easy to get trapped into, I bought this infrastructure for this department and then you know, not be able to reallocate it even when it should be. And can you also talk about how is this different or related to repatriation? There's a lot of conversation about repatriation in data center infrastructure. Um, I get asked this question a lot because we, we see the trend lines by working with our enterprise customers. Repatriation where workloads are moving from the cloud back to self-managed infrastructure um, is real. The companies are looking at their cloud spend. They're looking at 
you know, what their captive costs are and how to manage it. And the ones who've done a good job actually cloudifying, having a cloud native approach to running their infrastructure, find that they can pull those workloads back to self-managed infrastructure with the same fidelity, the same CI, CD, the same immutable immutability and API driven controls that they were enjoying in the cloud, but for much less money with some better controls, better data integrity, some data sovereignty re resolution. Um, all of those things are, are very much factors that we see when companies are evaluating how their workloads are going. Repatriation doesn't mean abandoning the cloud 100%. It means, just like we've talked before, having a better control on what mix of infrastructure you want, better controls on when data is going to move around. Um, and, and that is very much a real trend. Um, and none of it works well without having this bare metal layer um, as a core foundation for that repatriation. So the stronger your bare metal foundation, the stronger you're able to do that control and work, the easier it is to come back and, and repatriate. Um, and it's worth noting here, it's, it's, not, it's not as if we're taking, we're going from the cloud back into the 1990s data center. When people are repatriating workloads, they are bringing their data set, their, their workloads from cloud into a 2024 data center with, you know, high utilization rates, great APIs, you know, highly dynamic infrastructure, a lot of automation. It's, it's not, repatriation isn't moving backwards. It's actually moving forwards into a self-managed infrastructure because you can, you have better control, both of cost and, and data and the infrastructure and workload. Can you also talk about uh, what does it mean for customers uh, when they look at it, bare metal, virtualization, de-virtualization, how do they look at it? Is it uh, kind of a journey they get on where, you know, in traditional world, when we talk about software modernization, we talk about a lot of refactoring. What does de-virtualization mean for them? So it's a really, it's a really deep question. Um, nothing in IT ever should, and we don't see it, move 100% from A to B. Every, everything is always stepwise change. Um, with with pilots, proof of concepts, with with weight, you know, and, and you know, being able to sort of pull the right workloads over, um, that's always been an important part of successful designs here. Um, what we see is the ones that are being repatriated are the ones where they've actually done a really good job making them dynamic and agnostic. Right when you've taken the time to not be too wired into one cloud, and you've 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 done that work, you've put in that time, those are the workloads that can be migrated over very, very effectively. Um, but it's the same type of thing. If, if you're running a workload that has a lot of costs or runs a lot of infrastructure, those are very good candidates for repatriation. If you're building a system where it's new, it's just coming up, you don't know what the workload is, you, you know, you, you want to, you don't, you, you're still building and destroying and, and churning through that initial design phase, those are those are great uses for the cloud. Um, you know, even if you're doing repatriation and you're 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 doing best in class and you can you know buy infrastructure and bring it up quickly, uh, and we're talking about you know a matter of days for actual getting actual data center infrastructure running, it still takes a long time to go through that whole supply chain process, right? Have the floor space, get the servers, order the servers, bring them on, spec. I mean, all of those things take time. So what we're talking about for repatriation are often mature workloads, things that have really known uh, footprints in the cloud, usually bigger footprints in the cloud. Those are great candidates for this. Um, and one, one note here is that there's some talk uh, in circles I travel in that things that require tremendous power and the very latest uh, technology, like a, a big training set, those things might remain in cloud where the cloud vendors you know, have the resources, but then running the inference of that model that might be something that you pull back on house where you want more control over um, what's happening, the data sovereignty, how that model gets used, right? Um, and in a lot of cases, our expectations are that the inference side of running AI models is actually going to be the more durable, long-term, higher demand component of this application. And so one of the things that's really important is that we are seeing companies intelligently switch they're thinking or split their thinking between the inference and the training side of their models. So they, they know they have to train models 
that we're talking about building small LLMs so that they can be applied in very, very detailed, highly effective cases. And then those smaller LLMs run in inference farms where they don't require hundreds of GPUs to be interlinked in massive high power systems. That's what training is for. A lot of times an inference model, especially if you're using a smaller model, you could run 10 or 20 of those models inside of a standard machine with a couple of GPUs and a, and a fairly normal memory footprint. Um, that's what we're looking at. When we're looking at repatriation and we're looking at devirtualization and running your own bare metal infrastructure, it's not necessarily building a whole bunch of training farms. It's actually coming back and looking at your inference workloads, which companies are rightly architecting to need and plan for. So the expectation is every application people are building in the future will include some degree of inference. And that inference will be done at scale as part of the normal workloads for these systems. That is a big part of why they're looking at devirtualization as a trend, because it's challenging the architecture and the capabilities of the systems they've bought in their refresh cycle. Um, that was going to happen either way. Broadcom just accelerated the trend by making their licensing changes and pricing changes. What does it mean for Reckon? This is straight in Reckon's wheelhouse. So we have, for the last 10 years, been working to build just cutting edge uh, bare metal infrastructure and automation. And our mission has been very simple. It's to make the bare metal automation, the, the actual running of that self-managed infrastructure repeatable and easy so that when you buy infrastructure, we show up with software that has all of the best practices baked in, that all that expertise, all that knowledge, all of the streamlining that we've been doing for the last 10 years is baked into the software. So when our customers are buying that infrastructure, they operate it with a much higher degree of confidence. They operate it with a higher degree of collaboration so that when things happen in that infrastructure, when there's patches or security issues or UEFI changes or, or vulnerabilities exposed, right? Those are normal components for running infrastructure, but because we've baked that into the platform, that actually is part of a way that we can then take um, shared knowledge, shared learning, shared capabilities, and we can distribute as part of the platform back to our customers. And so it really is a very uh, liberating thing to look at being able to run your own infrastructure, but not having to invent your own bare metal automation, figure out how to do patches, buy it exclusively from one vendor and be beholden to that one vendor's patch or out of band management style, right? What we've really done is taken what has been um, more of a, of, a, of a trade of managing bare metal infrastructure where there's, it's done differently and, and in a unique way for every customer. It's very hard to do at scale. It's hard to do things at scale up. And it's hard to find people who have the expertise. What Racken has been able to do is turn that into a product where that automation software and controls are actually things that, that people want to run their own infrastructure and put it in their own data center and, and lock it behind their own firewall. We actually take all that expertise and then embed it into the product and give customers the benefit of that lift in running their own infrastructure. And it's, it's transformative in the ROI they get and in the confidence that they have in running that infrastructure. It really does change how they how they think about what they can buy and how they operate it. How is market, how is the ecosystem reacting to devirtualization? What kind of, if it is early days, what kind of trends, what kind of future you see? Oh my goodness. It's fun in that, you know, three years ago, two years ago, the idea of bare metal and data centers and buying data centers um, and running infrastructure was, was sort of seen as like not that exciting a trend line, right? We, we had baked in this assumption that everybody was going to be in the cloud and the cloud would own everything. Um, and in the last you know year, especially with the AI craze heating up, that assumption has really been torn apart. So for us, it's a lot of fun. We've, we know, because we've been working with customers and watching what they do, that they are committed to running their own infrastructure. But even inside these companies, they are starting to realize that the ability to control and own infrastructure, the assets, the data, um, is something that is a, a strategic importance to their company. And so we're watching um, across the board, you know, interest in hardware OEMs, interest in AI, interest in data center real estate, talk about uh, power, even edge. Edge has always been sort of bubbling below the surface. 
Um, all of these places where there is a need for uh, companies to manage and run their own infrastructure, there's a lot more green grass here where companies are realizing that um, they they have to do it and even more, even better that they want to do it. Uh, and so we're finding a lot of interest in, in these topics um, at the at the executive levels. And they're starting to realize that they, they can build their own infrastructure and run it um, and do it with a high degree of capability. Rob, once again, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about virtualization. And I look forward to the next discussion. Thank you. As always, a pleasure. Thank you. 